The William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And on behalf of all of us, we thank the USDOT, Canadian National, BNSF Railway, Hanson Professional Services, and Union Pacific for their ongoing support of the program here. It's greatly appreciated by those of us on campus as well as those participating via the internet. I'd also like to extend a welcome to, the, to those of you joining us via the internet today, which includes representatives from STV, ARUP, Federal Railroad Administration, uh, National Association of Railroad Passengers, METRA, LTK Engineering, RJM, uh, Hanson Professional Services, Banesh, um, CSX, Train Dynamics, Patrick Engineering, New York State DOT, uh, WMATA, Amtrak, Sistra, Parsons, HW Lochner, ESI, uh, WSP, TTCI, AECOM, um, Illinois Department of Transportation, and Boslo. So we've got a good crowd that's wow. tuned in uh, via the internet. So. Um, um, and those of you who are dialing in, if you wish to receive PDHs for your participation today, please send LB an email with your information as described in the email announcement for the seminar. METRA oversees commuter rail operations in northeastern Illinois with extensive responsibilities including day-to-day -day operations, fare and service levels, capital improvements, and planning. METRA operates more than 700 daily trains on 11 different lines using 242 stations. This makes it the largest commuter rail operation in the U.S. outside the Northeast Corridor. This presentation will introduce METRA, including how they do business, an explanation of the engineering department's responsibilities, discussion of METRA's 2018 capital program, and an update of METRA's PTC implementation. We couldn't ask for a more qualified speaker today, Mr. Bruce Mar Markeski, who is METRA's chief engineering officer. In this role, he directs nearly 700 employees responsible for the railroad's capital construction projects, communication systems, and oversees the maintenance and construction of all signal and electrical systems, track and bridges and stations, parking, and other facilities owned by METRA. Mr. Markeski joined METRA in 1987 as a communications engineer. He was soon promoted to director of communications in 1990, and he had responsibility for planning and implementation and maintenance of all communication systems. Since 1991, he's instituted programs and helped METRA save more than $28 million in capital and operating expenses by bringing communication system design and installation functions in-house and other cost-cutting measures. Mr. Markeski holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Electronic Engineering Technology from the DeVry Institute of Technology, and he's earned certifications in Project Time Management, Crisis Management, PTA ITS Project Management, and Quality Management Plans and Quality Assurance Procedures. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Bruce Markeski, who will um, be presenting an introdu introduction to METRA's engineering department and an overview of their 2018 capital program. Thank you. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Good? Doing well? First off, I just want to thank the University of Illinois, uh, Dr. Barkin and uh, Dr. Edwards for inviting me here today. I, uh, I've been down to the, uh, the lab at least once before, and it's, it's great to see the, the interest and the, uh, and the ambition of the students who are in the program. It's, 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 a, it's a great industry to be in. Um, when I speak to uh, crowds such as yourself, I always want to just make sure that a lot of people don't understand, uh, especially uh, kids, I call you kids, kids these days don't understand what the railroad really is. And I always like to say it's not your grandfather's railroad anymore. The technology and innovations that the rail industry has gone through in the last decade and, beyond, and, and in, into the future is phenomenal. Um, Dr. Barkin mentioned about positive train control. I'll get into that. There couldn't be any more of a techno, uh, technology challenge for the industry. It's probably the biggest thing that we've ever faced in the industry. It probably will never be surpassed by anything else. But... Uh, We'll get into that in a second. So uh, how many have heard about METRA? Who knows what METRA, what, what METRA is? Well, excellent. OK. Well, if you look at our system map, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, quite intense. It's 3,700 square miles of territory in six collar counties, 
around the Chicago region, and also we do provide service up into Kenosha, Wisconsin as well. Um, we have 11 lines. Ten of them are diesel. One of them are electric. The only electric line that we have is a 1,500-volt DC cantonary system that runs out of, out of the downtown area as far, par as far south as a, uh, a uh, suburb called University Park. It's about 33 miles of track, and that's the only... And there's two other sub-branches that are much smaller, but between the main line and the two sub-branches, that's the only electric service that we provide. The rest is diesel. And, uh, and if you look at the size of this, I mentioned 3,700 square miles. It's effectively, if you combine Rhode Island and Delaware together, that's the region that, we've, uh, that we uh, have. And uh, on outside of the Northeast Corridor, specifically New Jersey Transit, that's the number one commuter rail as far as, uh, as, far as customers in the country, we run number two. The one thing that we do hold over all of our peers is that we have the best on-time performance. For 33 months straight, up until this past December, we went 95% or above for those 33 straight months. And uh, that was a quite a feat, but we hit some, uh, some uh, bad weather at the very end of December. We had a, a signal bungalow catch on fire, unfortunately, on Christmas Eve, which uh, sunk, sunk us below the 95 for after 33 months. But 95% uh, in the commuter rail industry is the benchmark for on-time performance. That's where you want to be, 95%. And uh, we're back at it again. We had a couple of struggling months, although these winters haven't been too bad. We always, uh, you know, as a kid, I love snow, but as an adult, I cringe when I see the forecast. Um, but uh, we're back on track. So for the month of March, we're back up. We had a couple of, I mean, January and February were a little challenging. Um, but uh, for the month of March, we're, gonna, we're hitting uh, 95%. So we're good with that. Um, and if you also look at the Chicago region, it's not just Metro who's in, out here. You've got freight railroads, you've got the BNSF, you've got the UP, you've got the CSX, you've got the NS, and you've got a bunch of short lines like the I Iowa Interstate, the Iowa Pacific, a Chicago Rail Link, the Belt, and it goes on and on and on. At any given day in the Chicago region, and a lot of people don't know this, some might, but I'm going to share it with you, anywhere between 1,300 and 1,400 trains move in and out of Chicago on a daily basis. And that includes our 700 trains. There's a few hundred uh, freight trains as well, like four or 500, it just depends on the, on the uh, delivery schedule and you've got about 99 Amtrak trains. So you think about that and to have our on-time performance to be the way it is because we have to interface daily with the BNSF and that's their main, that's their only line that comes into Chicago and that's heavy freight that comes into the Cicero Intermodal Yard. Then you've got the UP West Line which goes out from Chicago to uh, Elburn, out in the far west suburbs. That's their heavy uh, freight line. So we've got to work with our freight partners to make sure that we have, you know, flowing traffic all the time. And it's a great relationship that we have. I mean, they need to move their freight to make money. We need to get our passengers so they don't complain that we're not getting their job on time or getting them back home. So, I mean, it is an intense situation that we have in Chicago, but we manage it very well. And if you look at the, what we have as far as uh, infrastructure, um, I like to point out the, the number of track miles that we have, 1,155. If you were to lay track to track to track to track, you can go from Chicago to Disney World. That's about how you can look at how, much, how many track miles we have. And uh, we just, uh, just a little under 700 trains. We were making some service adjustments recently, so we were right around 700. We're at 686. But if you look at all of our trains that we run in, in, a, in per week, it's like 1,120 trains that we run. Per day, we've got nearly 300,000 daily riders, 290,000 to be exact. And then if you look at it on a year-by-year -year basis, a little over 78 million riders that we have. Some more infrastructure uh, information. In the region, there's 822 bridges that, are, that affect Metro. Out of those 822, we are responsible for 351 of them. So on an annual basis, every bridge has to be inspected at least once a year. Some get more than that, depending on the age and the condition. We might want to be you know, keeping track of a bridge a little more closely. It just depends. But the remainder of those bridges belong to, again, the BNSF, the UP, CSX, NS, and even some, some of the ones are owned by uh, uh, IDOT and also the Chicago Department of Transportation, they have some bridges too, but all in all, there's 822 bridges. Then the other thing we have is a, a, a great deal of grade crossings, over 570 grade crossings. And uh, as far as stations, you know, there's 242. 237 are outlying in the out, 
you know, in the suburb area or away from the city, and in the in the downtown terminal area, we've got five major stations. And as, and as you can imagine, we have to maintain all this equipment. So scattered throughout this six county region, we have 24 yard facilities. And again, a little bit of a equipment talk. We've got 150 locomotives, 840 passenger rail cars, and I mentioned the uh, the uh, electric cars. We have 187 of those that are called the Highliners. Um, you know, and we we also you know we we talk about our state of good repair. You know, we've got an aging system out there. It's one of the oldest fleets that we have. Matter of fact, uh, if you look at some of our passenger cars, uh, for those of you who can appreciate this, uh, they're ready to uh, apply for Medicare. That's how old they are. So, no, I wasn't looking at you guys there. <laughs> but nonetheless, we have an aging rail fleet. And, you know, we've, uh, we work closely with our, our, our funding agency, the RTA, and they've come up with a number of $12.1 billion that we need to invest over the next 10 years to get everything to the state of good repair. Well, that's a difficult challenge with uh, you know, the, the funding isn't exactly plentiful to get to that point, so it's always kind of like chasing a carrot on a stick, but you know, we have to do what we can to uh, make it work. I mentioned before about our best on-time record, and if you look at fares, yes, we have raised fares over the last few years, but there's a reason for that. There's a need for it. A lot of people don't like to see their fares go up. I'm a rider too, but you know, I don't like to see it go up as well. No, I don't ride free. We, Metro does not allow their employees to ride for free. We have to pay, so I'm a paying customer. But if you look at our peers across the country, we are still the lowest fares. And I also mentioned about the most complex system uh, in that previous slide. And now as far as our capital program, um, well, you know, before I get into the capital program, let me back up real quick. So at Metro, we have approximately 3,000 employees, a combination of, of, of uh, union folks that are under labor agreements and management folks. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good-sized company for what we do. Um, there's all different types of areas that we have to, as you can imagine, we're a business. I mean, we have an engineering department. We have a mechanical department. We have a transportation department. We've got accounting. We've got law. We've got contracts. We've got procurement. We've got an IT division. And the list goes on and on. But uh, enough of that. But if you take a look at this is our capital program on an annual basis, you see that number $196.8 million. Some people say, well, that's $200 million. I said, no, I'll take that extra $3.5 million because we need it. So typically we get in that range from 196 to actually sometimes as high as $300 million. It just depends what's going on. You know, we get federal funding. We get state funding. We also get local funding from, from the RTA, who is our, our parent company. Um, a little bit about the RTA, it's kind of like the, uh, it's an umbrella. So the RTA is the parent and the, us at Metra, CTA and PACE, and you know, everybody who's heard of the CTA, they run the L's and the buses, that's just in the city of Chicago. PACE runs all the suburban buses. So our three entities under the umbrella of the RTA, they're our parent company, so to speak. But uh, with all the different funding that we get from those agencies, that comes up to $196.8 million. Now, if you look at that, how do you catch up to your state of good repair? Can't, it's impossible. But we have to make do with what we, what, we, uh, what we have, and we do. So I mentioned about the rolling stock, and these are the dollars in the track and structure, signal, electrical communications, and so on and so forth. These are the big hitters that make up this money right here. And I'll get into some of that as, as I get a little bit deeper in the, uh, the presentation. But again, I mentioned about the old aging rolling stock. There's a whopping over $71 million that we've got programmed to rebuild locomotives uh, and our cars. Matter of fact, we just are in the process of purchasing 21 locomotives that we got for a really sweet deal. Our uh, chief executive officer was, uh, was uh, diamond sharp at doing the negotiations, and we've got 21 locomotives hopefully being delivered sometime the latter part of this year, and we're real excited about that. No locomotives, no, no, no trains, correct? You can have a bad rail car, but if you can't pull it or push it, you're not going to get very far. But that's what we have as far as what's in our capital program. Let's talk a little bit about the engineering department. These are the disciplines that I'm responsible for or the engineering department is made up of. Uh, we have bridges and structures, and it's exactly what it says. I mentioned about those 822 bridges, 351 being ours. We have uh, civil and structural engineers who work on bridge designs. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about bridges. I don't want to uh, get too into that right now, but I have uh, more slides to talk about that. Electrical, electrical propulsion. Electrical could be anywhere from 
the uh, power that's in our corporate building, the power that's in our yards that we, uh, that we use for maintenance. The electrical pul propulsion end of it is the 500, the 1500 volt DC that I was talking to you about on our electric line. That's what uh, electrical pul propulsion is. Track, kind of self-explanatory, we gotta maintain track. We, uh, we have a, a, a tie program we do every year. We replace anywhere from 40 to 50,000 ties per year. And uh, sometimes we do major rail replacement depending on uh, the condition of it. Two times a year we have a service come out and uh, actually one service actually checks the ge geometry of the track out to make sure that everything is engaged and in line and wearing properly. And we also have a, another firm, it's, it's effectively like an ultrasound. It shoots ultrasonic waves into the, into the rail to see if there's any, any defects going on that you can't visually see. So we do that in the spring and the fall. Now what happens from those reports is they'll tell us if there's something wrong and you need to replace a certain, either a curve or a tangent. It just all depends on what the report comes back. Two years ago it came back and we had to replace six miles of track that we, uh, we've never done that much track since it's been Metra for almost two decades. So we had to do a, a huge track replacement. Now, the grand thing is too is as a lot of folks retire, we're getting a lot of younger guys in here. They, this, this new crew that we had to replace the track never did this before. So we had the veteran supervisors and, and foremen helping out, but the whole crew was actually young. They never did this before. So we, we went off without a hitch. No train delays were, uh, uh, happened from it. And the biggest thing is no injuries. Because in the rail industry, as you all know, you know, we had a safety briefing in the beginning. Safety is paramount. And one of, our, one of our main things at Metro, we always want to explain to people, safety first, on-time performance, close second. But safety first is always what we want to be stressing. Signal, you know, we, uh, we have an extensive signal system, uh, signal system, as you can imagine. So that department is in charge of replacing all of the uh, old interlockings that we have there, we still have interlockings that are locally controlled at the look at that at a tower in a tower with relays. We are replacing a lot of equipment and going to microprocessor based systems, which are remote control, which can be sent to our control facility where the dispatching is done, which is a common thing in the rail industry. For the UP, they control everything out of Omaha, the Burlington Northern, out of uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and on and on. They, they're not, you, you can't be everywhere, right? But we do have towers that are still controlled by levers. You pull a lever, pull it out, push it back in, turn it, twist it, and it changes the switches out in the, in the interlocking. We still have those. They still work, but we are in the process of getting to it. We still have a old, lot of old legacy equipment in every one of these disciplines that we're needing to, to revitalize and, and, and renew. Telecommunications, that's the world I, that I came from in the beginning. We, uh, we, have, we, own and, we own and maintain our entire network, whether it's, it's copper, fiber, microwave. Uh, we operate out of VHF radio waves. That's our normal operating frequencies. Uh, but we have our own uh, self-maintained in-house telecommunications network. Yards and facilities, like I said, you, you got to have work going on in your own backyard, as I like to call it. I mean, you, we want to serve the customer. We want to serve the customer in a safe and efficient manner. But at the end of the day, we still have to take everything back and change brakes, uh, make sure the air conditioning is working in the summer, the heat's working in the winter, make sure those locomotives are, are getting overhauled so they last uh, 20, 30 better years before, they, before we have to replace them. Stations and parking lots. Well, that's, that's our biggest, you know, that's our first customer facing situation that we have as a station. You got out of your car in a parking lot, you walk up to our station, right? You want to make sure it's safe, clean, well, well informed, convenient. So we got to make sure we're always uh, taking care of our stations. And like I said, we've got 242 stations out there. Uh, a lot of maintenance has to go into them. Some of them haven't maintained, haven't had a whole lot of uh, care put into them for years. So we've got a maintenance program that our own forces take care of. But then sometimes there's larger scale station projects that we can't do internally. So we hire consultants to do the design and hire a contractor to come out and actually do the construction on it. But there's a lot of stuff that we've been doing over the last four years on our own with our own crews to a limit. We, we, our resource deck is, is deep, but it's not as deep as we'd like it, but it's, that's just what we have. But they're doing a phenomenal job in-house uh, retrofitting and rehabbing uh, stations that are in need. Line extensions and expansions, um, we're always looking to hopefully 
put service where it's necessary. But then again, that's a big investment. So we have to make sure that when we're thinking about bringing service to this community or that community or whatever, we have to know, we have to be able to project the ridership because it's, it's not cheap to do this. It's not cheap to run trains. It's, it, it's expensive. But we're in, the, we're in the, uh, the industry to provide customer service to, the, to people who want to take our, our service into in and out of the city of Chicago. Positive train control, I always tell people that's like the, the, it's like the jelly of the month club. It's the gift that keeps on giving all year long. Um, I'll talk about that near the end, but I'm heavily involved in positive train control. Um, and I, like I said, I'll get into that uh, shortly. You know, we talk about what's available for career opportunities, and there's a long list of, of different areas that we look for, for uh, to come into our organization. Civil engineers, structural engineers. Matter of fact, we're looking for structural engineers right now. If you've got a licensed SC out there that you know, see me afterwards because we're in dire need of a senior structural engineer and a regular structural engineer. So if you, if you know one, let me know. But uh, as you can imagine, civil engineers and structural engineers get into different designs for our facilities, our bridges, uh, structures. The, and I mean, what I mean by structure is electrical structures that hold up that DC canton area. So that's a structure. We have folks on staff who take care of that. Electrical engineers, there's a whole bunch of different areas where electrical engineers run into. Signal, obviously the electrical department, and telecommunications. We like to hire tele, uh, electrical engineers that go into those areas. Construction engineers, when we're building a station or a big facility, we also put them into a project management role, maybe a higher level project management role. Mechanical engineers, it's a little bit different what we call our mechanical engineer. It's not what you might think. It's more for like uh, fluids and dynamics. It's more for uh, HVAC systems and uh, pumping systems. So it's not into the pure mechanical engineering that you may think of. That's how we actually look at it. Computer science. That's actually been a big thing for positive train control. A lot of positive train control is IT based. And it's a combination of things. It's, it's also it's signal system based, it's telecom based, and it's also a lot of IT based stuff. So we're looking for computer science uh, graduates as well. Architects, well the architects, we've, we've got actually two architects on staff right now. They help when we get into the design of, of a brand new station because a town or a community or an entity could come in and say I want to build a station. We're not sure what we want it to look like. We have this amount of money, but we want it to be nice. So our architects sit down with that entities or, and or consultant, come up with designs for that. And of course, once we have all these projects out there, you've got to manage them, right? Someone's got to be watching the store while your contractor's out there doing the job, make sure they're doing it right. Everything is per specification. And actually, the most important, that they're billing us properly so we don't, we don't pay for something that we didn't get. So let's, let's start out with some, uh, any questions before I go on? Anyways, you can stop me anytime. Okay, all right. So let, let's talk about stations for a second. Um, right now, I mentioned it's a customer facing thing. So we want to have these stations safe, clean. So this station right here, this is an interesting one. This is out on that electric line that I was talking about. And it's right just in the area of the, well actually in the, on the, the southern end of the University of Chicago campus grounds. It's also just a within walking distance of the new Obama Library that's going to be built. Has anybody heard about the Obama Library in Chicago? Well, that's not far from our station. So we have teamed up with the University of Chicago, the uh, Department of Transportation in Chicago, and the Obama Foundation and building a station. So we're in the process of doing this right now. Our station budget right now is a little over $14 million. And uh, the design, we're hoping to start this quarter, the second quarter here, and uh, have it go, hopefully going out for bid for that station at the end of the, this year. Um, construction will start in 2019. But uh, we're working closely with the Obama Foundation to make sure that we have all the amenities necessary because we feel and they feel this is going to be a big, big station for, for traffic once the Obama Library does open up. Uh, <laughs> this is an interesting one. That's the, the existing stations at the top, it's a double wide trailer effectively, right? Um, you might think the project budget doesn't mean a lot for a station for $500,000, but the thing I want to I, I point out is that this was put in as a temporary station. It's kind of like when you buy a house, it's, it's, like, oh, it's our first house and we're going to buy another house, and it's just, a, it's just a big starting point. Well, this was temporary for 24 years. So we're finally taking care of it. We're gonna, we got our, our design, 
Actually, the, proc the, uh, the procurement's been out, and actually we've, we've, we've got a contractor in mind that we want to award it to. So we're going to start construction of that. And I know this doesn't look like a big station, 440 square feet, but when we put a brand new station there for someone, they're going to really appreciate it coming from what they've had. West Chicago, that's on the UP West Line. Um, UP West Line, as I mentioned, that is our, one of our uh, heaviest freight lines. You know, our two heaviest freight lines are obviously the BNSF and the UP West Line. That's where their main freight arteries come in and out of Chicago. But um, this station uh, is under uh, is going to be uh, designed in the second quarter. A, little, a three million dollar project we're looking at. We're going to do a, a nice rehab, and you can see it's quite historic. It has all the historic markings on it, so we want to make sure that when we do rehab it and restore it, it's to that to that same uh, uh, appearance. Hubbard Woods, a seven million dollar project. The interesting thing about this. Uh, particular station. This is one of the heaviest stations on the UP North Line and it is uh, in need of a, uh, you could see we had a lot of issues with the platforms crumbling. We had some issues with these, the staircases rotting out which we're in the process. We, we've already repaired that on a temporary basis but uh, one of those, one of the uh, top stations that we need to uh, take care of because this is the heaviest ridership on UP North Line. Carry another station that we, on the UP Northwest, which happens to be the heaviest ridership as a line on the UP. The UP has three lines, a, a west line, a north line, and a northwest line that goes out to the various suburbs. The northwest line for the Union Pacific is, has the heaviest ridership. This is an actual uh, a, uh, a partnership that we've uh, entered in with the, with the village of Cary. They actually took care of the design. We've put it out for bid. And actually, we have bids received, and we're in the process of taking the the, uh, the successful contractor to our uh, April board that's coming up in a few weeks. So um, that's about to take place. There's a, here's this, this historic station out in Blue Island on Iraq, Iraq Island Line, built in 1875. And uh, we're in the process of working also closely with the Historic Preservation Society because as you can imagine, when you have historic monuments, they want to be kept that way. Even, even rail stations are historic landmarks. So we are working with our consultant and our architects to make sure that we're restoring it according to the historic standards. A little, about $3 million. Van Buren Street Station, built in the 20s. A lot, very large scale station. It's, 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 one, it's, it's one of our five downtown terminal stations, even though it's, it's also, there's, on, on the Metro Electric, that electric line that run, I was talking about, there's two big stations. One of them is Millennium Station. It used to be called Randolph Street Station, but it was changed at the Millennium, effectively. And Van Buren. Well, they're only within about a mile of each other, but the ridership out of both stations is heavy on that line. And Van Buren, uh, over the years, we've been putting money into it, but it's, but it's uh, in, in need of a, a, a complete uh, rehab. The challenging part about this, although I don't have this in the slide, to get on, to get to, to one of the ways to get to the station is from Michigan Avenue. And it's actually below Michigan Avenue. So you go out downstairs and you go through a tunnel that's maybe 200 yards long. The problem is we have the Chicago Park District above us. And over the years, the roof, we've been doing a lot of repairs on the roof of that tunnel is just starting to just, we, we can't fix it anymore. So when we get a bad rain the, the, and, and there's an actual slope on that tunnel, it turns into a water slide. I mean, no one gets hurt, but it, the water can flow, it leaks. So this project, um, we were projecting about $40 million right now. It's a large project. And it's gonna be phased, it's gonna be funded over multi years just because of that amount of money. But it's important enough to us to take care of it because of the ridership and the decline in, or the, yeah, the decline in the condition and the, we want to make sure that we're always safe. So that water issue, we don't want to ever be a safety hazard. So we're addressing that in this project here. Okay, Pullman. How many people have heard of Pullman cars? All right, okay. Well, we've got a Pullman station because it's in the Pullman district, hence Pullman station. Well, that's what it looked like right there, right? Rusted. Kind of need some tender, loving care, right? 
So I mentioned a little while ago that our forces do some work. Um, and we've been doing it since like the tail end of 2013, early 2014, but we've been continuously out there with our own forces doing what we can do. So yeah, that's just a little closer up shot. So this was the next on the list. Um, some of the fellows came to me one day and said, hey, boss, we'd like to do something different at Pullman. And I said, well, what would you want to do? He go, they said, we'll show you. I said, well, do I must see it after it's done, or are you going to give me an idea what you're going to do first? I said, there's a difference here. I said, I trust you, but I mean, I really don't want it to be chef's surprise either, right? So they said, well, we're going to make it look like a Pullman car. I said, really? I said, how are you going to do that? And they gave me this rendition, and it looks like that today. That was done with our forces. We took the Pullman colors, made it look like it's a car, put the old Pullman emblem up there, and actually we worked really closely with the local state representative in the area because this is also, the area is also a national landmark as of within, I think, 2015, I believe, somewhere in there. But it's been recently, it's been deemed a national landmark. So we got the community involved, and I mentioned before about having partnerships. There's nothing more powerful than a good partnership and a good relationship, whether it's with your fellow employee, the community, politicians, the other railroads that we deal with, and there's nothing more powerful. So everybody chipped in, and this is what we got out of it, but that was built by our own forces. And there's another shot of it. I always like to show this one, even though it was done a few years ago. It's just, it's, 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 just a, it's just a testament of the work that we've been able to accomplish with our own forces. I mentioned yards and facilities where we have to take care of what's going on in the railroad. And here is our latest, latest uh, endeavor. That's, a matter of fact, this design is complete. It, the bids were received, and we actually have awarded a contract. Um, so it, it's in our program, but it's, it's in the queue to be actually started for construction in May. But what I wanted to point out about this facility is this is the Rock Island District. This is a facility that was built in 1947, and no major upgrades to it have taken place since 1947. And this is also the location of where we do our own in-house rehab of passenger rail cars. A passenger rail car could cost upwards of three to four million dollars, right in that range. We could take a car in, strip it down in an assembly line fashion, and get it done for about 1.8 million dollars. The efficiency for doing this in-house is just incredible. But I also said that we've got a lot of aging fleet out there, and they're always chasing that carrot, right? Well, we're doing about 30 a year, 30, 35, right in that range. So we are going to expand this facility. We're going to build a training facility. We're going to build a loading dock so we can have materials delivered, more of a secure storage area. Just upgrade all the facilities so now, at the end of the day, this, uh, matter of fact, one of the other good thing about this project is we budgeted it, we projected it at $32 million, it came in at $29.4 million. So we got some really good, uh, really good competition. And uh, so we're going to up this to 60 cars a year. And this is going to start in May. We're going to have a groundbreaking in May. But it's going to be a phenomenal, uh, it'll be a phenomenal uh, project that we want to take care of. It'll help us get to that point of just, you uh, you know, rebuilding our cars, you know, give, it, give us a better kind of breathing room of our older, our older stock. The other thing that we've also kind of kicked around, but it's not for sure yet, once we get this in full swing, construction's about two years. Once we get it in full swing, there are talks about actually bringing other companies in, other carriers to do their equipment, other transients and rehab their stuff, or even build other equipment for them. So we're always looking for ways to be a more efficient railroad, and we're always looking for ways to get our return on investment, which is huge in, in anybody's industry. Return on investment is, the, is what you want to, that's what you want to strive for. I mentioned more about, um, you know, doing stuff in your own backyard. And there's just a couple of extra things that, you know, things that we do. If you look at the upper corner, that's a train washer. You know, it's kind of like keeping your cars washed every day. Not every day, but keeping your cars clean. We want to keep our cars clean, too, because I mentioned about customer facing. You know, our customers see dirty cars and say, oh, okay, the station looks great, but here comes this filthy car. Can't they just get a, you know, mop and a sponge and, and a bucket and clean this thing? Well, we have train washes. Now, that one is actually outside. 
Uh, you know, and as you can imagine, from about December till about now, even though the weather's been milder, you're not going to be washing trains. So the, the trains on that particular district suffer to getting the proper cleaning. So we want, we want to build as something all along these lines where it's, it's enclosed, it's heated, so we can actually we can clean train, we can wash trains in the winter. Bridges. How many civil engineers are out here? Wow. Okay, cool. Structural engineers. Look like no one's going to see me afterwards about that job. <laughs> Two jobs. <laughs> Anyways, so as I mentioned, we have 822 bridges out there. 351, again, are ours. But if you look at the ages of those bridges, we have 89 of those bridges are at 128 years old. We've got another 205 that are 118 years old. And as I keep going down through the statistics here, 164 that are 108. And then a measly 88 that are like around 98 years old. Now, some of those bridges built back in 100 years ago, people think, oh, you got to replace it. It's 100 years old, you just got to instantly replace it. Well, not really. When bridges were designed back then, no one really, no one really knew what to expect from this big, giant steel steam locomotive. They knew it was heavy. They knew it was massive. So what did they do? They overbuilt the bridges. And I'm not saying that all of our bridges that are 100 or years old don't need to be replaced, but it's not just an automatic all the time. So we do, like I mentioned earlier, we inspect every single bridge that is our responsibility once a year, and that's by federal law we have to do that. And we make repairs if we need to, but we also have a bridge program where we can't, we're, we, we don't have the capabilities as a company, I don't have the forces or the resource deck to go in and buy the steel, install it, and, you know, we, we, don't, we don't get that deep. So we hire contractors to do it, and we have a bridge program, and we do several different types of bridges each year. We try to do at least three to four, but bridges can run anywhere from three million to 10 million just for the bridge, and depending if there's any other facilities that need to be built with it. Well, this is an old timber and masonry bridge, yes, timber, and uh, it exists on our Rock Island district out in the... Uh, like the southwest part of the city of Chicago. Uh, it's part, like I said, timber, part masonry. It was uh, rehabbed as far as putting in new timber because the timber might last you 30 years, maybe a little longer. Uh, right now, that was done in 1973 when the timber was replaced. This project's looking at about $7 million to do. So that's one bridge that we're looking at. This bridge is at our Milwaukee district. Uh, this, uh, Built in 1899, so there's one of the bridges that were built before the turn of the century, the other century. Um, the design is in the process. We want to get this out on the street. This, 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 this bridge actually is, you know, and then there's exception to what I said. Not every bridge 100 years or older or whatever, right? This is one that has to be get done. It's just in that type of shape. It needs to get done, so that's why it's, it's on the list. It's, up on, it's high in the queue. So... Uh, it's going to be totally replaced, $12 million to do it. The design is going to, should be done in this quarter coming up, and we're going to get it right on the street for, for, for bidding. Another bridge, uh, again, on our Rock Island district, about $4 million. This bridge is built in 1929. So uh, even though it's in one of our infant, infanter bridges, there's a, an example how a newer bridge needs to be replaced. So that's about a tune of about $4 million. Again, that's in design right now, and we want to get out for bid as, as soon as the third quarter. This bridge here, again on the Rock Island, there's been, you know, there's, we're doing a lot of bridge work on, on that particular district because that's the one that's really uh, calling for the need for it. Um, this will just be some, some rehab of the concrete and the bridge, it's, the bridge deck itself. A little over, little over a million and a half dollars for this. But uh, this bridge was built in, where's my notes, 1916. Uh, so that's on the list. That design is complete. That uh, actually is in the procurement system right now. It just we don't have any, we don't have the bidders back, so we don't know who the contractor is going to be. So that's in the process of getting in the construction uh, phases. Electrical. Oh, no, I skipped one. Sorry. I mentioned the UP West Line all the freight they have. Right now, on the UP West Line, all but two sections of their track on the West Line is triple track. And we partnered with the UP, a rather large 
partnership, uh, totaling close to $118 million in, in total. So right now, it's two sections of track that need to be put to triple track. Currently, we're in the process of doing this smaller gap right here, a little less than two miles on the west line. We are working with the UP. The design is finished, but we're still working on some real estate acquisition and some environmental issues that just need to be resolved. At the end of the day, well, and then what I'm showing up here for $95 million is that western gap, we'll call it, we call it east and west, if you look at it from a, from a location standpoint. So that project right there is $95 million. With that said, this project, once it's complete, will give a lot more flexibility to not only the freight trains, but our trains as well. They're, they, everyone can get out of each other, other's way. I mean, ideally, triple track in a railroad is where you want to be, and that's what the UP is heading towards. So we've entered, actually entered what we've called a, a PPP, Public-Private Partnership. People heard about that? We don't do a lot of them, but this is by far the largest one that we, we have actually done. And uh, so we're, in, we're uh, heavily into it with the Union Pacific. So we hope to have this out uh, for uh, procurement by the end of this year. I say third quarter, but there's still stuff that needs to be, uh, I mean, I keep my fingers crossed that it is the third quarter, but uh, we, we want to get that started sometime in early 19 as far as the construction. Now electrical. Now, I mentioned that we have uh, electric trains, obviously, on our, one of our districts. And uh, a few years back, we bought some new cars, new electric cars, brand new. $585 million for 186 cars. With those new cars, they came the, op the option of faster acceleration times. Now, if you imagine electric train can get going faster than a diesel train, right? Well, when we bought these new cars, they came with faster acceleration rates. And by having faster acceleration rates means that we need to have more power out there. Out on our line right now, we have a total of uh, 16 sub and tie stations that are out there. Substations provide the power, tie stations just repeat that power and inject it. But effectively, we didn't have enough of the substations to inject the, the full power that we needed. So we had to convert the tie stations into substations to accommodate for the new, the new power need for these new cars. And uh, there's three locations that we still have to upgrade from a tie to a sub, $21 million. That, um, that design is actually almost done, and uh, we'll be heading out for bid third quarter and, make, and get that construction, hopefully start at the end of this year and into 19. It's going to take, it was just not just doing the work. There are in locations where we have to do the work, but also keep in mind that we don't want to affect train operations at the same time. So we have to work around certain windows where we don't affect what's going on for our bread and butter, with, which is safe, reliable, and efficient service for our customers. Um, I mentioned about that yard that we want to start building more cars. Well, by doing that, the facility needs a complete upgrade on the electrical distribution system that's out there. So our design, it's a little over two, about two and a half million dollars. Design's a little over, it's about 60%. So we hope to actually finish that design up, get it up to our procurement uh, folks and get it out for bid so we can start construction fourth quarter. And actually, I'm going to probably challenge the electrical guys and get this done earlier because this power is going to be needed for the construction of that new addition that we want to put on to increase our rehab output. So I, this has to uh, go a little bit quicker, so I'll be pushing the electrical boys on that one. How many people have seen the movie Young Frankenstein? <laughs> it's an old cult movie back in the day when I was growing up. But uh, you've heard of Mel Brooks, right? Right, Mel Brooks? Well, that switch on the left there, those knife switches, Mel Brooks actually called us and said, I want to do a remake of Young Frankenstein. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that knife switch panel is still in operation. That exists today. I mean, our goal is to go to all microprocessor controlled switch gear. But some of our, I mentioned about the sub and tie stations. Those sub and, those sub and tie stations were actually built in 1926. Still in operation. That knife switch is still in operation. But for a measly $300,000, we can go upgrade it to a modern, new technology, microprocessor controlled switch gear. 
And uh, we also have to take care of the engineering department's also responsible for life safety systems. And uh, we want to make sure that you know, people are protected. And this is an upgrade of for about $800,000 to make sure that all of our life safety systems that at one of our downtown stations is up to code. It's, it's a, with new technology, more reliable equipment. So we're in the process of upgrading all that. Signal system. I mentioned to you about towers that the lovers, that tower is in existence today. It operates. Matter of fact, does anybody know what a high rail vehicle is? You do? Okay. Well, I high railed yesterday on this specific district and went right past that tower. Um, the tower actually looks worse than what it looks like how you operate it. <laughs> so we have our design. It's actually complete. And this tower was built in 1890. Well, the interlocking was built in 1899. The tower was built in 1901. Um, it, the design is done. We're just working with some developers in the area because we may have to do a track shift for it where it currently resides because of a developer in the city of Chicago has a piece of property that we're actually grandfathered on that we have an easement, but they want to develop on. So we're kind of on, a, on hold right now, but I don't want to be on hold too long because this is one of those facilities that is in need of it. At the end of the day, we'll have all microprocessor controlled equipment but at a remote location. I mentioned earlier how we dispatch our trains from remote locations. In this one, there's actually a guy in that tower right now who flips those, those levers. And uh, no, the rail buffs can't have these when we, when we uh, take it out of service. <laughs> I'm sure someone else has claimed to them already. It's a long list. But uh, we'll remote that to our, our control facility when this project is uh, when it's done. Um, round out. Roundout is a uh, historical infamous location. Um, if you're familiar with the northern suburbs of Chicago of Libertyville, people know where Libertyville is at? Okay, so effectively it's Libertyville. I mean, they call it Roundout. I don't even think it's a real town. It might be. That's unincorporated. There you go. Back in 1924, this was the site of the great Roundout train robbery, where a little over $3 million of payroll checks from, I want to say it was either Milwaukee Road or the Sioux Line, the old Sioux Line back in the day, was stolen. This was the largest train robbery in American history. And it was right there at Roundout. But at the end of the day, we still have to replace this old relay-based control system that's out there and to a tune of about $14 million for this one. Um, the design is ready to go. We're in the process of getting it with our purchasing department. We hope to have it out. Again, I challenge the signal department. We want to get this maybe out in this quarter, if, or this, this second quarter coming up here. here. And uh, make, I want to get this on the street. It's just in, it's in need. Um, we're going to do the complete plant, all new switches, all new, all new steel, all new signals, uh, and a, a little bit of a different track layout just to make uh, operations more streamlined and effective. Now, I mentioned telecommunications. This is actually what our dispatchers uh, utilize to talk to trains. That screen on the left is a touchscreen uh, display, which they're allowed to access radio base stations along our lines. Our, on our lines, we have base stations strategically placed. So as a train traverses the track, we make it's designed so the coverage blankets the area that they're at. And the dispatcher knows where that train is as it's traveling from a to B, as it's going from A to B, they can communicate with it by knowing where it's at and select the, the proper base station so it can talk to. Um, this system was actually installed back in 1994 and it's still operating, knock on wood, but there's other features that new technology provides for us. Parts are becoming harder to get for this particular piece of equipment, so we need to upgrade it. We want to be more proactive in replacing things versus waiting for it to break and think you got your money's worth, but then at the end of the day, you don't have a, a, a device or whatever. So we want to be more proactive and get ahead of it. Positive train control. How many have heard about positive train control? All right. Well, positive train control, the largest unfunded mandate in I believe U.S. history. Positive train control out of our pockets. I, I put 350 to 400 million dollars. Right now, we've got it tagged at about 385. Now that's just for Metro. Now let's look at the entire industry, all the freights, all the short lines. You got other passenger. I mean commuter lines. Then you've got Amtrak. Amtrak we call a passenger line, not a commuter line. When this system is complete, the industry expects the railroads to have spent 
anywhere from 10 to $13 billion. And again, unfunded, coming out of our pockets. Thir 10 to 13 billion, yes. I know, it sounds a lot, it is. Um, and it comes with a lot of challenges too. This, is, this doesn't exist. It's not something they buy off the shelf. And one of the other hard parts is you just can't go on career.com or monster.com or whatever out there or go to a headhunter or a recruiter and say, hey, I need PTC people. They'll say, what? What's a PTC person? Well, you don't have them. So besides the money, besides the technology that we're working with that's it's, 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 it's developed, but it's constantly maturing. As you can imagine, it's heavily software-based. There's been numerous revisions of software releases. They keep changing. And then you've got to look at the personnel that you need to install it, maintain it, operate it. It all just comes into a, just, a huge, just a huge challenging project. Now, now here's the one thing about positive train control. So, and you guys know what it is. I don't have to get into explanation. You pretty much you've heard what it does. The, the most challenging, by far, part of positive training control is what's called interoperability. What that means is that if I'm on my railroad and I cross the Norfolk Southern, the CSX, any rail line, and railroads do that throughout the country, I have to communicate to that other railroad's host computer to say, hey, I want to come on your territory. My engineer is certified. This is my train length. This is, this is all my algorithms that go with it. And can I come on your property? So it goes through a, a check, make sure that you're, you're certified to be on PTC. The train's OK. Everything's good. But then we request information to say, are there any slow orders out there today? Are there any work crews out there? Are there speed restrictions? What are things that we need to look out for? So there's an exchange of information. Sounds simple? Maybe. That's the hardest part, though. Because you could have a Mac. You could have a PC. You could have Louis computer from Brazil. You could have some other computer from on the Antarctic. Every railroad runs their own system for their host. There's no standard for a host. So everybody wants to run, OK, the UP and all those guys who do freight, they do freight, okay? But the way they do business is their business model. So their company is set up to operate in a certain way. Now, you bring all these people together. Let me go back. And I want to show you this. This is the best part. Well, not for me. It's a, it's a headache. There we go. The spider web, as I call it. This is the most challenging location of positive train control in the entire country. There are 13 of us that have to play nice together in the sandbox. So if I was just to run positive train control from here to here and I don't cross anybody, it's not as bad. I'm, don't, I'm not downplaying it, but it's not as bad. But if I have to talk to you and you and you and all this information has got to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you have to have your database updated. I have to have my data up base updated. I have to be able to get to your database. You have to be able to get to my database. That's all, all got to go on seamlessly when 1,300 to 1,400 trains are running every day in Chicago. Pretty easy, huh? That's what I tell people. But anyway, so where are we at with positive train control? You know, there was an original deadline of December 31st of 2015. Now, we all knew we weren't going to make it. It's just incredibly difficult. A lot of the material wasn't, you know, the equipment wasn't ready. A lot of the rules weren't really set. Money wasn't available. That's always a challenge. So we went back, and I, and I actually sit on the uh, National Board for Positive Train Control with the Association of American Railroads, AAR. I am the uh, commuter rail representative on that board. And we knew it wasn't going to happen. When, when you hear the freights talking about, they're, they're kind of nervous. There's a lot to do. you gotta take, you got you to take really good creed with that. They have more money than God. They have the resource deck. They have the knowledge. They've got the experience. And I think I can just keep going on and on. So when they say they can't make it, I'm following that lead because I knew I couldn't make it. So I worked with our, our ex-CEO. We worked very closely with... Uh, uh, several different senators on the Hill in D.C., and we came up with criteria for a new extension. 
to get us to 2020. But then Congress came back and said, well, it's not that easy. You've got to earn it. We really want you to get done by the end of 18. We're like, oh, it still ain't going to happen. But they said, if you reach certain milestones by the end of 18, you can request the extension to be pushed out to 2020. Ah, I like that. So what we need to do by the end of 2020, and we're on target for every milestone to be met. Matter of fact, we're going to have everything ready to go by October 1st and submit our letter to the FRA requesting the extension. You have to have all of your onboard equipment installed. That means locomotive, cab cars, and the Highliners. And you have to have all of your wayside equipment. There's equipment that actually goes at every interlocking and control point, every single location, and it talks to the signal system. That has to be done. You have to have the required spectrum necessary for this, our spectrum. We've, we have that already. That's been, we've already acquired it. You also have to have the personnel trained for one line, at least for us. For, for Metra, we're going to go on the Rock Island District that goes from Chicago to Joliet, what's called revenue service demonstration. What that means is we're actually putting a train with customers on it and operating PTC. We have to have one line in service before the end of this year, which will be sometime in early third quarter. And then the final part of, part of that is you have to have all the personnel trained for that district. The original law was everybody had to be trained. And we went back to Congress and said, well, if I train people for, if I'm going online with that first, because that's what I'm required to do, but I train all these people, what's going to happen? They're going to forget. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? <laughs> as the old saying goes. So what we talked them into is saying, as we bring lines into commission, we'll have the people trained for it. So we'll be doing the Rock Island first, our electric trains next, this little branch of the Southwest Service, which is uh, probably the most challenging. I'll get that in a second. And then we'll bring in the rest of our lines in, in the service. But train people as you go along. It makes sense. Now, will there be retraining as we go forward? Sure there will be. Because as technologically advanced as this may be, there's still human error. Garbage in, garbage out. If you don't put the right information in, you won't operate a, a train unsafely. It just won't let you, the train won't be allowed to move. That's the thing. So there's training and retraining that's going to take place. So, and one of the most hardest places that we're going to have interoperability is our Southwest service. We're going to face with the CSX, the NS, the, NS, the Harbor Belt, uh, no, uh, the Belt, the Chicago Rail Link, and us. There's five of us. So what it means to an to a engineer who's starting out his train, because he's got to program all this information, today he just has a, a bulletin that says, I'm going on this line. I know that I'm crossing this guy's tracks. I know I'm crossing that guy's tracks. I know that. They talk over the radio, and it's all communicated ahead of time. But if this engineer goes in there and, does, and doesn't type in or select all the routes that he's going to cross, he'll still operate because the, the, the system says you've entered all the information correct, but as he's going down this line and he gets to a crossing at the NS and he didn't select the NS, the system will say, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. You didn't tell me you wanted to go across the NS. So now it stops the train. And now they've got to reinitialize this whole system and communicate to that host computer, the NS, and say, hey, am I good to go across this? Here's my guy. I'm good. I got my light credentials. My, here's my train. All my, all my characters is my train. All my algorithms are intact. Can I have permission? Okay. Still a safe situation, but it delays our train now. So what they do today is just like second nature. The guys, who, the engineers who run in this line do it day in and day out. They don't have to do that. Now you do. And again, Human error. Not to the point of a safety issue, just to an inconvenience to our customer. Yeah, I, want to get, I need to get to the end. But I wanted to show you that map. The interoperability piece of, of positive train control is just incredible. Last but not least. This is a, uh, we did some work on an interlocking called A2. Has anybody out here ever heard of A2? Yeah, we got some people. Okay. Built in the 30s. It's a jigsaw puzzle of switches. It has 
six of our lines that go through it, plus Amtrak, so a total of seven railroads go through it. On a daily basis, 331 moves go through here, lots. If one switch in the wrong place fails, the parade is over until we can get a maintainer out there to fix it and hopefully you can fix it fast enough. But with all that traffic, you know, it's hard to get in and out safely to make sure that he can make the repairs. Well, back in uh, 2015, we started a replacement project of all the switch panels that are in there. And uh, it took over 15 separate weekends to get it done. And I'm happy to say we didn't take one train delay. Oh, let me say one thing better. We didn't have one injury and didn't take one train delay. And it was the first time that we actually worked with the Union Pacific side by side because we are responsible for a certain number of switches. They're responsible for a number of switches. So it was the first time our engineering forces actually worked side by side with the Union Pacific forces. But as I mentioned, 331 trains per day moving through there. So if you want to, oh, I, I can probably do it, right? Yeah, there we go. I put this together for your viewing enjoyment. Connect over the speakers. Oh. It actually took longer to figure out to, for us all to agree, and even though I'm the head of the department, I had to barter my way to get that song. But we had all these different song requests. <laughs> and uh, Van Halen wasn't one of them. If someone cho chose Van Halen, so I, I don't think so. My board won't appreciate that. But anyways, that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. You have to... There we go. Um, I had a question regarding like the purchase of like the old locomotives. Um, I know that they're the EMDs from the from California Pacific Northwest. In terms of like PTC equipment, will those EMDs be out be fitted with the PTC equipment? when they come here or will you guys be doing that um, in-house um, after uh, receiving them? Okay. My understanding is that we, they will not come PTC equipped, that we have to put the equipment on them. That's the mechanical department, so I was going to jump on my engineering, but I, 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 know about the, uh, I know about the purchase, but my understanding is that we're going to have to equip it, so that's going to be on us. I know you mentioned the number of bridges that are responsibility of Metro to take care of. How many of those track miles are you guys? Is the eleven hundred and some track miles? Oh, you should, um, or is it that just four hundred? I think I hit four hundred and sixty some miles are ours. Oh, four, okay. Hang on. Four something. Four thirty seven. Four eighty seven. Four eighty seven are ours. 
Oh, I got a question about the because you say that you run trains on the uh, you, for example UP uh, track. So I was wondering how the priority of UP trains or the metro trains is determined. We have two peak periods: one in the morning and one in the afternoon in the evening. Effectively, six o'clock in the morning till about eight forty-five in the morning, and from about three o'clock in the afternoon till about seven o'clock at night. We work around. The agreement is that we they don't affect. They well, I try. They try not to affect those peak periods. So though the windows in between, they run their freight, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't run them during our peak periods. Just the effect has to be kept to a very low amount. So because that's those are our biggest, obviously our biggest times of our customers are rush hours. The morning getting to work, the evening getting home. So. We, they try not to get too involved in, in affecting those peak periods. Does it happen? Sometimes we have a freight train breakdown, and it's in a spot where it can't cross over, and now we're stuck. So, it does things do happen, but we try to we we, we try to work with them so they're not in the peak periods. Uh, from one of the research I did uh, by the end of last year, uh, I know, uh, so. For the uh, from the point of view, the the passenger cars of Metro has uh, the average age of them. They're already twenty nine years old. And uh, what's a what's a major strategy for Metro to replace them? And the like criteria of the well, we're in the well, we're doing the rehab program on our own, and we're also in the process. And I can't get too in far into it because we're kind of in the blackout period because we're working on reviewing some bids to buy new rail cars. So I can't really talk about it because it's one of those purchases that, like they say, they call it the blackout period. Everybody on the <laughs> review staff is in, it's like a gag order. Yeah. You can't talk about it. But we're in the process of buying some cars right now. And what are the funding resources of, of you guys like for purchasing new cars and uh, how stable they are? Uh, one, one more time. What are the funding resources? Funding sources. Uh huh. Um, for these cars that we're buying, well, typically it's federal money. Um, and I'll back up a second too. When we bought the 186 electric cars for 585 million dollars, that was bought with Illinois state bonds. We do get money from the state for bonds. We get money from the feds each year. We also get money from the RTA in the form of bonds that they sell. Um, so it could be a combination of things. It just depends on how much, number one, how much we're looking to, to use and what's available at the time. So we try to use all of our resources whenever we can, but those are our three main sources of, 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 of funding. Now, there are different federal grants that are out there that we apply for from time to time. Um, so we'll even go for a grant. But again, that's from the federal government as well. But on an annual basis, the federal government gives us money to spend on our on our system all right thank you and i want to just point out one thing i did i want to talk about for ptc i talked about how much money it is and and um what happens with ptc is that we have all these things you saw the things the engineering department is responsible for there's also things that the mechanical department is responsible for engines locomotives like this young man was just mentioning when you have to take money that you get from your funding and put it towards PTC, other things get affected. So you have to really prioritize what needs to get done. I mean, positive train control from an installation point of view is going to go away eventually, the money that we spend on it right now. Then we can get back to that money that we cut aside for positive train control can go for other things. But for the last four years, we've taken $236 million just from our federal end of the money out of our program to put towards positive train control. So we've had to do a lot of reprioritization. We had to see what has got to be done, what can wait a little bit. It's kind of like juggling chainsaws while you're ice skating. That's how I like to put it. It's, it's very challenging. But uh, the thing is also about positive train control. Once we get done with the capital expenditure of the purchase installation and then we get implemented, then it's going to cost money to operate it. You've got personnel, you've got licensing, you've got spare equipment and other things that go into it. 
the industry is not 100% sure on what it's going to cost per year. I've heard anywhere from 5% of what you spend to 20%. We're projecting right in that 5% range, but I'm, I'm trying to stay between 15 to $20 million a year to run it. And we don't all know yet because no one's really had it out there in operation. So you don't want to under forecast your budget. You look like a hero at week, at month eight or nine and you're coming way under budget and it's like, yay, we're under budget. But you don't want to be that guy who says it's going to cost me $10 million and it cost me $18 million. Someone's going to come back and say, no, yay anymore. That's not good. You went the other way. So we need, and now that doesn't get federally funded. That comes out of our fare box, out of our pockets. All this money that we're spending to install it, we're getting in forms of grants, federal money, so on and so forth. The operations end of it is coming out of our pockets. So what we charge for fares goes in our fare box, and we take that money out of there, and that's going to have to pay for the operation. That's going to be another challenge going forward. Everybody was always thinking, yeah, we've got to install it, got to install it, got to get it going. But when you flip the switch and everything's running, it's going to cost me money to take care of it. So it's, it's like building a house. Build a brand new house, eventually you're going to have to replace something, appliance, the roof, windows, whatever, flooring, you know, you know the list goes on and on. Same thing. It, it's, you got to maintain it. you got to take care of it. Um, so I think you kind of answered part of the questions, but in, in a more general scope, what? so you've shown us a lot of projects that you are undertaking now or plan to do so. What are the, some of the criteria? For example, is there any prioritization criteria for stations, communications, rolling stock, and so forth? And within the same category, for example, stations, you, you, you presented uh, ten, more than 10 stations that you want to do. What are the major criteria that you evaluated the priority of all these projects? Mainly condition. You know, if they're in really bad condition, they need to be rehabbed. Um, that, that's the main thing because we want to make sure it's always safe and, and, and clean and convenient and inviting. So it's the condition of it. And then sometimes you'll get a community that will go out and find money and say, hey, I found $8 million. We want to build a new station because we want a new station in our town. It's our centerpiece of the community and so on. So we'll look at that. And if you come to us with money because those rehabs, that comes out of our funding money. But if a certain community says, hey, I wanna, we want to spend some money on a station, we found all this money, can you help us? Well, most times, and pretty much most times, we'll even contribute to that as well, because you did some work for us, you found that money, well, we might even help you out and commit some dollars to it. So we'll take it out of what we do and help out. Because if you've got a community that's done their due diligence, done their homework, so to speak, and they went out and found the money, because it's not just under any rock you walk past. It's, there's, a little, there's a lot of work to go on out and get federal funding. It's, it's, it's a reward at the end of the day, but at the same time, there's, there's work behind it to get to that point. So if you've done that, we want to work with you. We want to be a partner with you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, there is a lot of projects that you mentioned, but what are, I know you do a lot of community meetings, I'm assuming. Yes. And what are your challenges? And also, who are, I guess, how much would a freight railroad partner with you guys? Are they also at the meetings, or who else are involved in it? Some, it, it, depends on, oops, it depends on the project. So, for instance, this, well, one point, that West Line extent, or, uh, triple track expansion we're doing in UP, we worked with them. They were in meetings with us when we went out to the communities and when we did the environmental assessment, when we have to acquire real estate. So they'll come to the table with us. And then there's always people who don't want more railroads where they're at. Kind of like moving next to O'Hare Airport. You know, you know it's there. There's big planes taking off and landing every day. You move by a railroad, what's going to be there? It's just not going to be tracks, right? You're going to have either our trains or freight trains going through. So you'll have people who love us because they take it and they get it and they understand it and it helps vitalize the economy. And you have people who don't like it because they're loud, they're unsightly, they're ugly, they're smelly, and the list just goes on and on. They're intrusive. I'm sitting on my deck. And this big train goes by all the time, vibrating my house. So um, those, are, so it's kind of like a pendulum. You'll get a bunch of people who love it and a bunch of people who don't love it. So we go out to those people who don't love it and say, look, it is a railroad. We're trying to make it convenient for everybody to get in and out of the city of Chicago where everyone needs to go. We want to keep cars off the highway. If you were to shut down our entire system, it was told by a professor, uh, is that Schlickman at DePaul? 
Yeah. Uh, he does transportation. He figures if Schweiderman, sorry, Schweiderman at the Paul, he's, he estimates that if you shut down Metro, you'd have to build 29 more lanes of expressways because it couldn't handle what we carry. It couldn't, the, infra, the highway infrastructure couldn't handle the removal of our system. So we go out and we try to tell people that and explain to them, do we win? Sometimes. Do we lose? Sometimes. But at the end of the day, again, <laughs> you move by a railroad, you move by O'Hare Airport or Midway Airport or wherever, the planes aren't stopping, the trains aren't stopping. So, I mean, it just depends on what group you, 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 you work with. And then if they have concerns about the environment, we try to address them or we try to mitigate noise. I mean, we put in... Um, 11 bridges on our U Union Pacific North Line, just north of the, in the city of Chicago, north of the Chicago River. We, done 11, we did 11 bridges. In a certain area, we had to put tie pads or tie plate pads on to mitigate the noise. And we did it. I think it's lower noise, I don't know. But we did it to uh, accommodate the request. And so we, we do work with people, and then we, we put up retaining sound walls in certain areas, more for retention. And we made some of them translucent because they had gardens next to it. So it just wouldn't be just solid retaining wall, but we made it translucent so the sun would come in and their tomatoes can grow and everybody's happy. Um, so it, it, it just depends where we're at and what it is and who's our, who's our fan and who's our foe. Absolutely. We, uh, we let, when we do, uh, we do grade crossing renewals every year, anywhere from 15 to 25. Take care of the crossing, make sure it's smooth. Sometimes the material, it, it wears out and makes the, the, it real rough. We put out a list in the beginning of the year where we're going to be because we have to close that crossing down for nine days. Nine days, it has to be closed. And we let them know what we're doing. When we do a, a, a tire rail project, we let our customers know, say, hey, we're going to be doing this project from this day to this day, and let them know what's going on. We put out alerts over the phones, an email, rather. We, uh, we have Twitter. We also do seat drops, the old-fashioned way. We put them, out, put them on the seat, and we let people know that way. We make announcements at stations, and, of course, our website as well. So we, we're very proactive in getting that out there. Um, it's very important to let our customers know what's going on. People aren't always happy with what you do, <laughs> as you might imagine. But if you tell them ahead of time, they're, being more proactive is better than being reactive at the end of at, at when when it becomes a if it, if it becomes a problem. So we want to get out there. We like to, communications is huge because we're a customer service company. We serve the customers. That's our our. our our, our, that's what pays our bills. That, that's what makes everybody in, in and out of the city of Chicago. Keeps the economy flourishing. Well, the internet phone board is lighting up, so I need to <laughs> ask some questions from... If they're from Metro, they're cut off. I told them they had to be at work and not watching this today. <laughs> <laughs> when the boss is the way, the, the, the crew will play. Uh, I don't think any of these are... Well, one's former Metro, but we're going to let okay. him. Um, anyway, uh, so the first question is... Um, how many lines of code is currently required for operation of a locomotive, and how many lines are added for PTC? Uh, rough oh. order of magnitude. Oh. I, the, the questioner says they've heard four to eight million on the freight side. You know what? I don't have any. I'd have to. Get, you know what? If I can get back to that person, I don't know. Well, it's Phil. So. Phil. Dom. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if he's saying that. Then that's probably we're pretty close. <laughs> I mean, I was in I was in our lab yesterday. I, I took a couple of board members to our PTC lab, and I've been there several times since we built it. It's actually every single, I call it PTC in a box is what it is. It's a room about 14 by 14. It's not very big, but it has every single piece of PTC equipment that we need to, to make PTC happen. It's great because we install it. Our guys can learn off of it. We can train other people on it. And as we try to impl as we implement it, it's right there in front of us. It's in a lab environment, not a production environment. But what, what I'm getting at is <laughs> when we are in the lab and they have the simulators running PTC, the code is just flowing. You could see it. So I, I, I'd have to get the answer. I don't know. All right. 
Well, here's another question, um, and this is pretty wide open, so I think, you know, maybe pick what you want to address. <laughs> Can you speak to the benefits of the CREATE program? Mm, absolutely. I mean, we had a great success with our P1 CREATE, the flyover, Inglewood flyover. For many of you who don't know, the Inglewood flyover grades, uh, or separated Metra from the Norfolk Southern. It's uh, in the Inglewood area of Chicago, like about 63rd Street and the Dan Ryan right in that area. We would cross each other via diamonds. We had control of it because it was actually we had to control the diamonds. But if a Norfolk Southern train got in the way, obviously we're not going anywhere. So to mitigate that, the CREATE program came up with a, a design to build a flyover. It's about a 1.6 mile, 2% grade bridge. It's actually the highest point in Metro. It's like a mountain in Chicago. Um, but that, what that did was, so it separated our trains from their trains. Now, every, now, Norfolk Southern and Amtrak actually were on the same track. Now they go under us, we go over them, everybody's happy. Um, there's another CREATE program that we did out in the Bensonville area near O'Hare Airport, which uh, is Irving Park Road, right, where the Canadian Pacific went right through Irving Park Road. Just on the north side of Irving Park Road, FedEx and UPS have some of their biggest hubs that they have around, right there. So as you can imagine, a freight train uh, going through there at a slower rate, or if it breaks down, that traffic's congesting. And that's not just for the UPS and FedEx. There's a lot of just regular traffic on, on Irving Park Road. So they grade separated that, but with the track realignment, we had to move our interlocking at one of our control towers about 300 feet to the east of there. So that helped out all the congestion in the area for that, for that particular project. But creates a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a magnificent group of people. They've got a great mission. They've done a lot of good things. We uh, still have one big create project called the 75th Street SIP that's out there. It's a combination of several projects that uh, will help us on our Southwest service which we interface with the Norfolk Southern, the CSX, the Belt, and the 75th, it's like 75th, uh, 75th and Western. there you go, 75th and Western. Huge traffic jam, I'll call it. When the 75th Street eventually gets them going, it's each, and it's made up of, I think, five or six different projects, and they'll start making it less congested, more free-flowing, easier to move traffic in and out. Now, the only thing is, we call it the billion-dollar baby. It's literally about a billion dollars. And uh, money just doesn't grow on trees. So I know the great folks are applying for large grants to get it going. And Metro's a big supporter of it as well. So we, we're, we're, we're fully in partnership with that. Next couple questions. This, this question is from a retired Metro employee now working with us for a certain federal agency in Washington. <laughs> I know him well. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know him well. Uh, he asks, what's the status of the flyover at Belt Junction under the CREATE project, and uh, what's been the impact of PTC on your rail tie surfacing and undercutting program? Well, uh, I mean, that portion of the CREATE, I mean, that's, that's part of the 75th Street SIP, so, I mean, I mean, the concept is there. I mean, we haven't, the design alone is 80 million plus just to design it, so, that first round of grants that the uh, CREATE program is actually applying for will, will be contributed to the design. Of course, we're going to contribute some money to the design as well, so not real far. But as far as we haven't experienced anything with PTC for our rail projects yet because we haven't got that far yet. I'm sure somewhere down the line it's going to impact what we do. It's just right now we haven't gotten that far. Okay. And I think this is the last question from the online audience. Uh, in the recent omnibus bill, the federal, the FTA is provided with 13.5 billion in total budgetary resources, which includes 9.7 billion to help local communities build, maintain, and ensure the safety of their mass transit systems. Uh, how much of this bill is Metra seeking for track and structures? I'll have to get back to you on that because okay. that just came out. Fair no, enough. Yeah, we're, we're, I'll, I know we'll have something. I just couldn't tell you exactly what we're what we're going to get and how much we're going to ask for. Well, but well, I could say this to answer that: we'll get as much as we can. <laughs> Good job. It's kind of like you know you go in that wind thing and there's dollar bills are floating around. We're going to grab every one. We're going to put 
stick them on my fingers and just grab money. Well, um, I want to thank you for a fantastic seminar. I think we need to wrap it up. I know I've got a class here that starting soon, and um, but uh, again, thank you very much for coming and for my your pleasure. Uh, fantastic seminar. Now, can I ask one favor? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I promised someone to work it. I would do this. Who's a Lionai fan? Can I have half of you do I-L-L -L and the half of you do I-N-I? -I? Can we get that? <laughs> Ready? I-L-L. I-N-I. I-L-L. I-N-I. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go Illini. <laughs>